Thank you for joining us for this webinar recording on preparing for the berry season with insect disease, weed, and nutrition updates. This webinar recording started about a minute in due to a little bit of a technical difficulty getting the recording started, but you only missed a brief introduction. Thank you. Question I asked is, do you have a lot of existing weeds uh, coming into renovation? What's the risk of those? Uh, first, it's the regrowth of established weeds after renovation. While they may appear dead after mowing and tillage, uh, as we've seen in many cases, uh, they will regrow quite quickly. And the real downside is even with mowing, pulling, and uh, tillage, uh, a well-established near mature weed will produce seed uh, that will cause issues, of course, moving forward. So if you have a lot of existing broadleaf weeds in particular, which tends to be our issue, we're able to control the grasses uh, prior to harvest with things like clethodim. Uh, so it's a tend to, we tend to focus on broadleaf weeds. And if so, uh, 2,4-D prior to mowing and tillage is a very common option. Uh, that's for established plantings only. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind there are hundreds of 2,4-D products uh, in the marketplace. This is a generic product. Uh, that's been around since uh, World War II. Uh, so there are a lot out there, but most aren't registered on strawberry. Be sure to check that label. And uh, be careful with the surrounding broadleaf crops and uh, desirable uh, vegetation. Uh, 2,4-D is a product that's been known to move off target in a variety of mechanisms, whether it's particle drift at application, uh, volatilization or the conversion from the liquid form in which it's applied, uh, to a gaseous form that can travel a long way. Or uh, more commonly, what I see is, uh, is a tank contaminant moving on to another broadleaf crop on a diversified farm. The second question I would ask is, so if we've applied the 2,4-D, we, we wait a few days, uh, mow the strawberries, and then till them into the desirable row configuration at renovation. Uh, the question that next comes up is, do you have broadleaf weeds that survive the 2,4-D, the mowing and the tillage? And those tend to be perennial broadleaf weeds, most commonly dandelion and uh, Canada thistle uh, that'll survive uh, those renovation strategies. Keeping in mind a quarter inch section of Canada thistle root will produce a new plant. Uh, so tillage is a wonderful planter uh, at that time. If that's the case, you might consider spur, the active ingredient in that is clopyrrolid. Uh, you may have known it as stinger, but now on the generic market, we also have spur. Uh, and it's a spot spray application before strawberry regrowth to these perennial weeds in particular. Only one application is allowed per year and don't tank mix it with any other pesticides. And I can tell you from personal experience, you have to be willing to accept some crop injury. Uh, so spot application to the uh, perennials in particular, trying to avoid uh, any strawberry uh, plants will pay the best uh, dividends. The next question we ask is, uh, what weed species do you expect in the field? And this is where a little bit of planning in the summer renovation uh, can pay dividends in terms of getting weed management until that fall dormant timing. I get the most questions about strawberry weed management between July and November. Uh, because we don't have very good tools for weed management at that point in time. So we need to make our renovation weed management last as long as we possibly can uh, to try to get to a fairly clean fall dormant application uh, just before mulching. So we go through the common questions. Do you have broad leaves uh, versus grasses? And if so, which of each type? Uh, annuals versus perennials. And then we cross list that weed spectrum that you might expect in the field. Uh, particularly in the late summer going into the winter annuals uh, with the herbicides you have available. And if you look in the Midwest spray guide, uh, there's a nice, nice chart that lists uh, the herbicide options uh, versus the weed species that are commonly found in berries in, in general. Uh, so with that, we can plan a residual herbicide that best matches the weed spectrum. Uh, those residual herbicides, uh, depending on soil type, moisture, and product, you could expect them to provide uh, five to six weeks of weed control after renovation. The most common examples, just using common trade names here, Prowl H2O, uh, Sinbar, Spartan 4F, and uh, Chateau. 
Another question you might ask is, are resistant weeds a concern? And the reason for that is uh, resistance has become very common in the modes of action or sites of action that are commonly used in strawberries. Uh, there's a great example of an unfortunate situation in Illinois with water hemp, uh, where a population has been identified with resistance to seven herbicide sites of action, including the PPO inhibitors at Chateau and Spartan, uh, glyphosate or Roundup and several others. So it's important to know if that's a concern in your area. One uh, little side note here uh, with Spartan 4F, it's a great tool for strawberry weed management. Uh, but in Wisconsin, we have a special local need label for Wisconsin growers only that dictates a very specific way to use uh, Spartan and strawberries. Uh, that's because on the general full label that you see on the right hand side of your screen, uh, the directions were written on that label that don't really uh, give good details of use on uh, strawberries. So Minnesota, it's a bit different situation. In Wisconsin, we have strawberry specific uh, instructions on our special local need label. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That special local need label in Wisconsin is available on the DACAP Special Pesticide Registrations webpage. Keep in mind with these resistant weeds, among those that we're most concerned about would be the pigweed species. Uh, in particular, uh, palmer, amaranth, and uh, water hemp. Uh, so make sure you're able to identify the pigweeds that you might have in the field. Uh, the reason we're concerned about those in particular, palmer, amaranth, and the water hemp's, are that they're traveling around the Midwest almost always. Greater than 90% of the populations are resistant to several uh, herbicide modes of action. Uh, so it's important to be able to identify uh, water hemp in particular uh, that's traveling rapidly around areas where we grow strawberries. This is an example of that from my colleagues in agronomy here at UW-Madison, just showing uh, water hemp populations that have spread across uh, Wisconsin that are resistant to ALS inhibitor herbicides. In this case, the example is imazethapir or Pursuit, not a product we use in strawberries. On the right-hand side, though, you can also see the resistant populations uh, spreading across Wisconsin that are resistant to glyphosate, uh, the active ingredient in Roundup. And that's gone from just a few counties a few years ago to almost all counties uh, in Wisconsin at this point. The final piece to think about is uh, thinking comprehensively. And this is where a little bit of planning pays long-term dividends. Think comprehensively. What's your plan for fall dormant herbicides? I often hear people say, well, I'd like to use something like Chateau in the fall, but I've already used my seasonal maximum at uh, renovation. So think about how you're gonna piece those together for a comprehensive weed control program. Some herbicides can only be used once per year and almost all have seasonal maximums. Uh, so plan ahead, rotate the herbicide sites of action uh, when possible to reduce the risk of that situation, uh, like the water hemp in Illinois. And even outside of resistance risk, if you use Sinbar every year, you'll select for populations that Sinbar never controlled and shift the weed control spectrum because we're growing a perennial crop. That's a time frame in which uh, by using the same tools over and over, uh, you'll get more prevalent weed species that were never controlled by that herbicide. Uh, chickweed and white cockle are the two examples uh, most common in strawberries uh, where we haven't diversified our weed management uh, across the season. So a little bit of thinking ahead uh, as we get into the busy time of harvest here, I think will help you uh, not only have a cleaner fall, but uh, come into next harvest uh, cleaner also. So a question in the chat box about uh, where the notes are and such. Uh, right before this started, I posted this short presentation on this website uh, in a PDF form that you're welcome to uh, download if valuable. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any weed management questions? Type them into the chat box. While you do that, um, we can transition to Christelle. Okay. Let's wait just a second, see if anybody has any weed questions since Jed has to leave early today. And if not, you can always email me. Yep. That's great also. 
Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yep. And hear me also? Yes. Okay. All cool. right, well, it doesn't look like anybody has weed management questions. So if you have those questions, um, like Jed said, go ahead and email him. All right, thank you. Oops. And can you guys see me? Okay, good. Okay, all right. Well, so I guess I'll get started. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to set a timer so you'll hear it beep in 10 minutes and then we'll see where we're at at that point. I was hoping to cover uh, two insects that are the primary insects in Wisconsin, but um, in the Midwest, I would suspect um, in uh, berry production. So I'm not specific to strawberry or blueberry or any of those. It's really in general, the main two insects that we have problem with at least in Wisconsin and I know in other states, are spudwing rosophila and Japanese beetle. So I was going to cover uh, kind of what to prepare for as far as um, what you can plan for management strategies. So this is our spotted wing rosophila um, that you all know, and hopefully. And um, I just won't go over that, but uh, we all know that they attack our soft fruits, so that will be all of our um, primarily raspberry, fall bearing raspberries, blueberries, but the strawberries are also, and grapes, some that we have to keep in mind. Um, and every year it seems to be uh, more that we have to keep them in mind for strawberry. So what you wanna do is at this time of the year, uh, you can wait a little bit um, into early June, mid June, but you wanna start monitoring for those, uh, those insects. It's gonna be very important to know whether or not you have spotted wing in your uh, crops, when your fruit is gonna start becoming susceptible. So now is the time where uh, the first one is gonna be our strawberries. We wanna be monitoring. We wanna see if we have spotted wing um, showing up in our, in our crops. One trap per acre, you wanna check them once a week. You wanna monitor in the crop, but you might also wanna put a trap near the wooded area because they are there. They're very present in high numbers in wooded areas and are likely to be coming from there in the spring. So that would be a good way of knowing ahead of time that they're coming. And this is a very simple recipe on how you can monitor with a yeast and sugar um, bait in a homemade trap. Another way to sample is if you don't want to do the um, excuse me, the monitoring for the adults is to monitor the fruit. And so this is what um, I highlighted at the bottom is really something that I would recommend to do was for strawberries and for grapes. Because the strawberry, they are, uh, the spotted wings uh, showing up later when the, um, uh, the fruit is almost at the end of harvest. So there's not really a need to have those um, traps. And for grapes, because we have a lot of flies at the time of the grape harvest, but we don't have um, really high susceptibility. So for those kind of crops, I recommend to really look at the, um, the, berry, the larvae in the fruit. For the uh, raspberries or blueberries, have those traps for monitoring the adults, because you're gonna have adults when you have your crops that are in full, um, full harvest. So for monitoring the fruit, you will just do the recipe that is here, you just collect some fruit that looks potentially susceptible uh, or that looks um, like it's been damaged potentially or even sound fruit. You put them in a Ziploc bag, you add salt and water. You have four cups water, a quarter cup salt. You let that sit for about an hour, you crush the fruit a little bit and then you look if you have a larvae in there. If you do, that means that not only do you have the flies but you also have a problem with infestation and you really need to take action. For preparing, um, as far as like now, what you can do early on when you're preparing is thinking about those cultural control strategies. Um, what we wanna do is uh, minimize the buildup of spotted wing in our crops. And so removing wild hosts, there's a lot, so that's not the best option. But if you have some of those wild hosts nearby, you may wanna remove them from your, um, around your planting. You're gonna wanna do, um, this, the harvest every one to two days. This is a study, I mentioned the name down here, that has shown that if you do that every one to two days and you harvest, you're gonna be able to reduce the population that you're gonna have in your 
uh, in your fruit. You're going to reduce the size of those larvae and you're going to be able to deal better with this pest. You will still have, have larvae, so this is as part of an integrated pest management strategy, but you, you will reduce the, the impact that you're going to have. And then you want to remove the overripe fruit so that you don't have a buildup of those uh, populations. So overripe or dropped fruit that you have. To dispose of, of that fruit that's either um, damaged and still on your vines or that are dropping on the fruit that are compromised anyways with or without larvae, you really wanna get rid of that fruit. So um, there has been this, the, uh, this study, the same one, that has looked at bagging the fruit and bagging um, fruit in a, in a plastic bag, regardless of the color of the plastic, whether it was clear, white, or black, after 32 hours, killed 99% of the flies, the larvae that were inside. No flies emerged. One or four hours of uh, bagging and solarizing did not reduce at all the emergence of those flies. So even four hours did not. So really something to keep in mind. If you plan on doing this strategy for disposing off of the fruit, and that, by the way, you can also feed them to your chickens if you don't have a lot, um, but you could uh, put them in a, in a sunny area and cover them with that same kind of plastic and leave them there, cover with soil so that the flies don't come in and out, and that would work. If you want to bury the fruit, um, I'll show you that in the next slide. There's a study that looked at that, but you do not want to compost the fruit. So you want to um, bury them, destroy them by solarizing, but do not compost. This is a study where they looked at um, burying the fruit. So the figure on the left is one where they looked at where are those um, pupae in the ground when the larvae drop to the ground, where are they? So on the y-axis, you have the mean proportion of pupae and on the x-axis is the, dis the um, distance from the surface. So the surface is zero and then you have the different depth in centimeters. And so you can see that they are primarily and it doesn't matter the type of soil, whether it was sandy or loamy soil, um, it was between zero and one centimeter. So they are the very top of the layers of soil. Uh, they bury just a little bit. Now, when they took those, they actually took um, apple pomace and they buried that in the soil. And this is the second graph here. It's the mean number of adults on the y-axis and again, the depth on the x-axis. And you can see here, that they had to go to 24 centimeters to see a 97% reduction in the um, emergence of those adults. And, and about beyond that, of course, they got even better. But anything less than 24 uh, centimeters of bearing that fruit was not um, really working. And they never reached zero emergence, even when they went to 48 centimeters down. Some of those, um, Adults, as they emerge, were able to climb their way out somehow. From the canopy and water management, that's something that you might want to think about. Um, pruning plants is something that uh, we've been talking about as a recommendation, but the study that came out recently looking at that uh, did not have very um, strong results on that. Um, the canopy management did not really make the plants less attractive to spotted wing, but there should still be uh, an improvement in spray coverage. So it's still something that you might want to consider, but it really didn't change the environmental conditions in those uh, blueberry plants that they tested. Um, there's also another study that looked at overhead irrigation versus drip irrigation. Uh, they found no difference in the fly emergence from the larvae uh, between the two kind of irrigation systems. And the idea is those irrigation systems, again, will change the humidity level that you have, and these flies like humidity and hot temperature. So you might um, change those environmental conditions. They didn't see a difference in fly emergence from larvae. That was the same between the two irrigation systems, but there was a difference with the pupae. When they had pupae, uh, they had uh, more flies that emerged with the overhead sprinkler than with the drip irrigation. And so this is likely due to the fact that the larvae are inside the fruit and are protected from desiccation, whereas the pupae are more exposed to the lower relative humidity with the drip irrigation. Exclusion netting is one that we talked about, something to consider uh, primarily for high tunnel, um, but the mesh size is really important. But all the studies that have looked at that have shown that it was really effective. So something to consider for, especially for blueberry um, and great for those that are susceptible. 
So if we think about then an action threshold for um, applying an insecticide, as you should all know, we do not have an action threshold because once you trap the first fly in the, um, in the traps or the first larvae in your fruit, you are already at um, economic threshold. Um, you already are gonna lose some of your crop. So this is your first trap, fly trapped is your, um, is your threshold. And of course, having fruit that's susceptible. If you trap a fly, but you don't have any fruit until September, you're not gonna start spraying until you have fruit. So then you would wanna use your insecticide on a very regular basis. And uh, this is from a study that we conducted, but this shows you on the y-axis, the average number of insects trapped, and on the x-axis, the timing of the day. And you can see that um, in blue, we have the pollinators, and in red, we have uh, spotted wing. And you can see that you have um, a lot of spotted wing drosophila from 6 to 9 a.m. with very few pollinators, and again from 6 to 9 p.m. And that's been shown in different cropping systems. You can see that the population of spotted wing kind of goes down in the middle of the day, likely because it gets really hot and then goes back up um, in the evening. And so the pollinators, as you can see in the blue bars, are really going, oh, here's my timer, um, are really going to be active early uh, in the middle of the day. So spraying at those times that I um, put in those um, orange, uh, rectangles is really going to be the best timing for your insecticide applications. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going through insecticides. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> you know that there's a lot in the Midwest Fruit Spray Guide. It has a lot of recommendations. There's a efficacy table that can really help you decide what insecticides to spray. And of course, there are some for organic and some for conventional. I'll repeat that Entrust is still the best um, organic product um, that's available out there. And with that, um, I'll just say that, uh, yes, after that, when you bring those berries back, you want to refrigerate those berries. Um, I didn't name the studies here, but there are studies that looked at this. If you are putting them, so if you harvest, like I was saying, every one to two days, two days is really fine. So if you harvest every two days and then you put those berries in a refrigerator, then you can um, kill most of the eggs and the larvae if they stay at 34 um, degrees and for 72 hours um, and it will sl stop them if they are in a, um, from developing if they're in the fridge so this is really important to do I will not cover Japanese beetle unless uh, there are questions later on um, but that's that's what I have thank you I think um, it's likely there are questions about Japanese beetles, so maybe if there's extra time at the end or if people aren't asking questions, you can get back to that part. That sounds good. Any question in the chat? Or I guess we can wait anyway, so, okay. I'm not okay. seeing any in the chat. This is a quiet group. Usually at this point we have quite a few, so mm -hmm. um, you guys have questions, remember to type those in. All right, so I guess it's my turn. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so what I have prepared today is a very short presentation with some guidance for nutrient management, and I'm going to exclusively talk about strawberries. Uh, I'm happy to answer other questions afterwards about uh, uh, raspberries or blueberries. So, oh, I don't know, it's not working. So uh, these are pictures from last week from our research station at West Madison. So um, strawberries were uh, blooming and some fruit is already set. This is last week and with the warm weather we've gotten this past day, I assume that everything is moving pretty fast. I haven't been out there yet. The raspberries that we have there, um, they were about, I would say maybe eight to 10 inches tall. We got a hit from frost from a couple of weeks ago and a lot of the foliage was damaged. There's no visible flowers, so there's no damage to any flowers. And I would assume that um, most of uh, the foliage is going to recover. And in terms of the blueberries, we have several cultivars of blueberries out there in the demonstration garden and they were uh, in bloom, uh, but that was last week. And again, I would assume that with the warm weather that we're having uh, this 
couple of days, everything moved really fast. So let's talk a little bit about uh, nutrient management. And there's four basic questions that, that we think about when trying to decide what would be uh, the best plant to fertilize our crops. And the first one would be how much nutrients should we be applied? When should it be applied? And the third and the fourth is what source of material is the best one to apply and how you should apply this material. So I'm gonna to try to focus on the first two because I only have 10 minutes. And I'm exclusively today going to talk about strawberries, and I'm going to focus on nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but happy to answer other questions about micronutrients afterwards. So to decide how much you want to uh, fertilize, or you need to fertilize your crop, uh, the first thing is uh, the dish analysis. This is probably like the best tool that we have to determine the quantity of nutrients that uh, our crop needs. So for June bearing uh, cultivars, the best time to take this tissue analysis that should be done every year is after renovation, uh, when there's enough new growth, uh, and preferably you wanna pick leaves that have been recently fully expanded. So that is the best time for June bearings. For day neutral, so ever bearing cultivars, it will depend on when you plant it. So an example is that if you planted them in May, uh, the best time for sampling these new fully expanded leaves would be in July. Uh, if you plant it in the fall uh, for the following year, then the best time to uh, collect samples for tissue analysis would be the following growing season, again, when you have new growth and fully expanded leaves. Ha. This is uh, sort of like a, a, an example of a range of what it would be um, the safe or normal range of nutrients that you would expect on a well, uh, on, a, on strawberries that have been well uh, fertilized and they are in their sufficient range of different nutrients. And then it will be different from the June bearing and the day neutral or the ever, uh, ever bearing. They will be closer to the day neutral ranges. So there's a lot of these different charts that you can find online. I got this from Oregon State University. There's one uh, from Cornell. There's several from Michigan. There's several, I think that Minnesota also has one. Uh, they're all very similar uh, in terms of, of this sufficient range. Uh, and you can find a lot of these in extension uh, websites from different universities. But the other thing that I thought it was interesting to show today, regardless of deciding how much nutrients you want to apply, is to look at how much of these nutrients are actually being removed in the fruit. So this is a, it's a very general estimation of the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and boron. And there's a combination of all other important nutrients that are being removed from the system uh, when you harvest fruit. So the numbers here are for a ton of fresh fruit. So in June bearing cultivars, for one ton of fresh fruit, you remove about 1.93 pounds of actual nitrogen. So if you have an idea of, of you, you can calculate at the end of the season how much fruit you picked, uh, you could do a basic calculation of how much nitrogen and all the other nutrients you would have to replenish to bring back the levels to uh, where they were at the beginning of the growing season. So this is another way of sort of estimated how much um, fertilizer you will need to apply. So talking specifically about nitrogen requirements for strawberry production, as I said, the tissue analysis is probably the most important piece of information that you would need. But also another thing that is crucial is to uh, sort of know a little bit about your soil and soil organic matter is definitely one of the things that you wanna consider when um, determining how much nitrogen you're going to apply. So organic matter, soils with high organic matter, like say over 6%, probably will need a very low percent of nitrogen just because there's going to be a lot of mineralization happen as soon as that soil is um, has enough moisture and it warms up, a lot of nitrogen is going to be uh, start getting released from the breakdown of organic matter. The contrary, if you have uh, soils that are very uh, sandy and low in organic matter, you will probably need higher levels of um, nitrogen fertilizer because your soil is not going to be not going to be um, mineralizing a lot of nitrogen. Also, another thing: if you have very sandy soil, 
is just to um, break the total amount of nitrogen in, in, in multiple applications so you make sure you're not having any leaching of uh, the fertilizer. So for June bearing, uh, for established June bearing plantings, um, if they're looking weak and or you see coal damage, uh, this is the only time that I will recommend to apply some of some nitrogen fertilizer in the spring and just a very general recommendation between 15 to 20 pounds per acre in the spring. And why uh, this is the only time that I would recommend to apply in the spring because in general we see for June bearing that if we apply a lot of uh, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer in the spring, all of this goes into more foliage and not necessarily uh, more fruit production and better and bigger fruit. So that's the reason why we, if you have healthy plants that don't have any damage and they're looking uh, nice and healthy, I would not apply any nitrogen fertilizer in the spring for the June bearing cultivars. Only if, again, if they look weak or they have cold damage. Uh, the ideal time to apply nitrogen fertilizer is about two weeks after renovation. That is the time when you want to apply this nitrogen. And the reason why you want to do that is because that nitrogen is going to go into the formations of flowers for the following year. That's the time, uh, those two weeks after renovation with flower induction and flower differentiation is happening for the following year. And that's when you want to use a lot of this. You want to put a lot of this nitrogen to support that process. The growth and the fruit production that happens from spring until you know, June, until the end of the harvest for June berry, all of that is supported by the reserves from last year's fertilizer. That's the reason why I mean, research has shown that the best time to apply fertilizer on established plantings of June berry cultivars is about two weeks after um, the renovation. For established day neutral, and I think this is also applicable for evergreen, you would want to apply every month a little bit of nitrogen because you're constantly producing. And so even though they also rely on research from last year, they need more fertilizer and they need it to be, um, they need it to be uh, applied during the month where you're producing fruit. So anywhere between May and September, depending on the systems, whether you have them uh, cover or whether you have them um, with tunnels, low tunnels or high tunnels. In the case of organic growers, if you are an organic grower, you might want to apply the fertilizer, the nitrogen fertilizer a little bit earlier, uh, right after harvest, not two weeks after renovation. And the reason why is because a lot of this organic uh, fertilizer comes, uh, needs to be mineralized. So it needs to be breaking down by the microorganisms in the soil to be able to release that nitrogen. So it might take a little bit longer than traditional fertilizer. Uh, just a, a note about foliar nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, there's been uh, some good re research actually in Minnesota showing that foliar fertilization doesn't do much for strawberry production. So the best way to apply fertilizer is to the, the soil, to the ground, not with foliar fertilization. Foliar fertilization might be uh, a solution if you have really extreme deficiencies, but it's not the main way that you should be feeding um, your strawberry plants. So again, I, I talked a little bit about this, about timing of nitrogen fertilizer for June bearing cultivars. Um, as I was saying, the new growth and the fruit production is mainly supported by the fertilizer that was applied in, during renovation the previous year. And the store nutrients in the fall are the ones that are critical to support the growth and the yield for the following year. That's the reason why uh, you want to apply it after renovation to be able, again, to support this flower bud formation for the following years. In the case of the day neutral, and it's also true for the ever bearing, uh, the stored nutrients are also critical for the initial push of growth in the spring, but they do need to uh, apply fertilizer, especially nitrogen, during uh, the months where fruit is being produced, and you wanna apply it um, every month, just a little doses of nitrogen to support that constant new flower production that is happening on day neutrals and evergreens that does not happen with the June bearing. So very briefly for phosphorus and potassium requirements, in this case, uh, we tend to base a lot of the recommendations for fertilizer on the soil test. So we talk about foliar analysis, but uh, soil analysis is also really important to determine 
how much phosphorus and potassium. And the reason why is because we want to put these nutrients as pre-planting amendments, mostly that's the best way to supply phosphorus and potassium. So these are um, a table that I, that I collected some data from some publications from the, the Oregon and Washington, but also from Minnesota Extension. And so these are just summaries of uh, very broad ranges of applications of uh, phosphorus as phosphate and um, potassium as potash um, for different range of concentrations in the soil. And uh, one point that I want to make is that for day neutral cultivars, if you're growing day neutral cultivars, the amount of potassium that you're applying needs to be similar to the rate of nitrogen. So if you're using um, a blend, and you're applying nitrogen, you would want the proportion and the percentage of nitrogen and potassium on that blend to be very similar. So you're applying the same amount of, of those two elements. And the reason why is potassium is one of the um, elements that is, that is extracted in higher quantity by the fruit. So you need to apply quite a bit of potassium uh, for fruit production in general. And uh, applying it at the same rate as nitrogen uh, has shown the best results for the neutral cultivars. And with that, uh, I will be happy to answer any questions through the chat or wait until the very end after end. All right, that was great, thank you. The chat box is still pretty quiet. All right, thanks Amaya. Um, last few minutes here, I'm gonna talk about berry diseases and how it relates to the weather that we've been having. Um, Amaya, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so first let's look at what the weather has been like the past few days. All right, so this map is showing, oh, my little, um, my little Zoom box is in the way here. <laughs> Okay, so this map is showing the accumulated precipitation that we got from May 19th to 26th. And you can see that a lot of parts of Wisconsin and Minnesota got between, oh, a quarter of an inch to maybe an inch and a half of rain over the last week. It really seemed like, at least in the Twin Cities, it really seemed like we got a ton of rain, um, but really it was just a lot of smaller um, rain events. So we did accumulate some precipitation. So where does that get us? Well, prior to this week, uh, we were consistently behind the normal precipitation for this time of year, um, but the rains we've been getting in the last 10 days or so really have brought us up to uh, about average precipitation for the last month. So um, you can see, you know, a lot of our two states are about at normal. Those are the gray areas. Uh, some areas of Minnesota, especially northern and western Minnesota, are still a little bit below average, um, but you know, southern Minnesota, you can see there is at least an inch over average precipitation for this time of year. So what else? Um, our days are warming up. I'm just using May 25th as an example. That was a couple of days ago when it's, we started to get some really warm temperatures. Uh, so these are the, uh, the maximum temperature for the 24 hour period ending the morning of the 25th. You can see that uh, a lot of Minnesota and Wisconsin had high temperatures between 75 to 80 degrees. Um, southern Wisconsin, even 80 to 85. And yeah, a lot of parts didn't really get below 70 degrees. So it stayed pretty warm. And this was immediately following um, a pretty large rain event for our area because it's been pretty rainy the last couple of days. The nights are not getting as cold at this point either. Uh, so this was, again, the 24 hour period ending the morning of the 25th. So just a couple of days ago, a lot of areas did not get below about uh, 60 degrees during the night, which means that fruit diseases really like these conditions. It's moist, it's humid. We're just coming off of a rain event that is not really uh, evaporating very quickly because of the humidity in the air and then it's warm. So fruit diseases really enjoy this. These are the conditions that they really thrive in. 
And even though we can't see those diseases causing symptoms on the plants necessarily, because for fruit, uh, for fruit diseases, a lot of the time, they're active early in the season, but we don't see the symptoms yet. We don't see the lesions yet that they're actually causing, but they're there, they're reproducing and they're spreading. They're either spreading by rain, uh, they're spreading by wind, and then they're taking advantage of those humid conditions to reproduce. So what are some of the diseases that we need to be thinking about right, right now? Well, for strawberries um, and you know, for powdery mildew, this would go for other crops as well, but pre-bloom, which depending on your crop and depending on your area, uh, a lot of your strawberries may be in pre-bloom right now. We're thinking about powdery mildew as well as leaf diseases and anthracnose. And then as we get to early bloom and bloom, then we keep thinking about powdery mildew, leaf diseases and anthracnose, but we also have to start thinking about those diseases that infect the fruit directly, which are botrytis and leather rot. So I'm not gonna go through all of these today. I only have a few minutes, but um, the goal today is just to give some recommendations of products that you can be using and uh, think about um, your strategy for controlling these diseases. So I'm just gonna zoom in on botrytis and anthracnose right now. Um, so botrytis, you know, really common. A lot of us are used to dealing with this disease. It's ideal conditions are between 65 and 75 degrees with rain at least once since the last time that you sprayed. Um, ideal conditions meaning that it's going to spread more rapidly uh, in that temperature range and in that humidity range. So it's recommended to apply applications of either a conventional or organic fungicide, which I will get into, at pre-bloom, early bloom, and after fruit set. So uh, it, those applications are especially critical for managing this disease, even though we can't see the symptoms yet. So it's important to know that as far as the synthetic options that we have for botrytis, there is some resistance developing on Topsin and Scala in some locations, and Pristine and Ravel also have a resistance risk. So it's really important to rotate chemistries in order to control not only this disease, but other strawberry diseases as well. So I've listed a few other recommended chemistries that can be used. Um, Captivate, which is Captan plus Phenexamid. Uh, that one, along with a lot of the other products, it can only be used twice consecutively before you have to rotate to something else. So that's just an example. Um, I found that Penn State has a really good page that, uh, that lists a recommended spray program um, for strawberry diseases, for fruit rot specifically, beginning at bloom. And uh, the main goal of that spray program is to give people ideas of how to rotate in order to decrease the risk of developing resistance. There are organic management options for botrytis. Um, so I have listed some of those there with their, uh, their application intervals. Uh, another thing that you can think about is choosing varieties that are less susceptible to botrytis. So Early Glow, Jewel, and Clancy have been found to be less susceptible. Something like All Star is considered very susceptible. Um, there's nothing that's completely resistant to botrytis. I would recommend avoiding spring nitrogen applications. And for organic fungicides, the recommendation is to apply at pre-bloom and then at early bloom and then 10 days later. Um, so double nickel, for instance, this product is a bacillus and it is a natural defense inducer. And so this is something that must be applied before bloom because bloom is when uh, botrytis really starts infecting the plants. And so uh, the point of putting something like double nickel on is to act as a natural uh, defense inducer. Um, same with regalia, using that prior to flowering for botrytis prevention is what's recommended for that product. All right, so anthracnose is the other one I wanted to mention. Um, I've heard from a few growers that they use chemistry that's not as effective on anthracnose earlier in the season because they want to save that chemistry for later in the season when anthracnose is most active. And I understand that, but it's also important to acknowledge that anthracnose can also be active at this point in the season. So uh, it can also, it can affect the petioles of the leaves, the leaf blades themselves, and the blossoms as well as the fruit. It's not just infecting the fruit, although we often see those infections happening 
uh, during the harvest period. But this is what it can look like earlier in the season. So it infects the stems, petioles, and blossoms in the spring. And that's why we need to, to not ignore anthracnose at this point in the season and consider that it might be out there infecting the plants. It can survive on weeds and other ground covers as well as overwinter debris. And so like a lot of our diseases, it's there and then it's stimulated by our wet, warm conditions. Its ideal conditions are rain and temperatures between 77 and 86 degrees. So when we've been having these wet, warm conditions like we're having right now, this is what anthracnose really likes. So it's recommended uh, to start fungicide applications early. So in early and full bloom, even though the symptoms are not yet visible. Um, what can happen if they infect uh, the, the blossoms as they're in bloom um, is that if it infects shortly after pollination, that fruit can be small and hard and misformed. So that's one of the things that we're trying to avoid. Uh, there are a number of synthetic fungicides recommended in the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide, specifically on page 111. And I'm going to get into some organic options on the next slide. So there are no totally resistant varieties for anthracnose, but uh, I do know that Chandler and Albion are two examples of varieties that are more susceptible. Uh, here's some of the organic management options for anthracnose. A lot of these are the same products that I mentioned on the slide before for botrytis. So you've got your Serenade products, uh, which is that um, one of the bacillus species. Uh, these are recommended at seven to 10 day intervals. Uh, Serenade Opti has been found to have the best efficacy according to the Cornell Organic Production and IPM Guide for Strawberries, which is a resource that I really recommend um, growers get and, and study. Even if you're not an organic grower, it's just good to think about these other products that we could be using. Um, so Serenade Opti is recommend starting at or before flowering. Um, hydrogen peroxide and double nickel both have moderate efficacy. Um, there are several other products that are labeled for this, but there's just not as much data or studies out there about exactly how effective they are. And those include Regalia, uh, Seraphel, neem oil, and potassium bicarbonate or millstock. All right, and then for raspberries, you know, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on uh, raspberry fungicide applications. Um, there's just not quite as much a constant disease pressure in raspberries that we have uh, with strawberries. But one of the things you wanna consider if you're choosing whether to do a fungicide application at this point in the season is have you been experiencing these diseases in recent um, spur blight, cane blight, raspberry leaf spot, and septoria leaf spot? Um, so if you have been experiencing these, that would be a reason to uh, try to go out and get a handle on these early in the season. The other question to ask is uh, dormant lime sulfur um, this year. And if you have, it may be less necessary to do uh, another fungicide application unless you, know, you had severe uh, disease incidents in the previous year, then it becomes more important. It's also to keep in mind, important to keep in mind that different diseases infect differently on raspberries. So anthracnose is going to be infecting our green tissues, you know, our new primocanes, leaves, petioles. Um, cane blight can only get in through wounds. Important to realize, you know, if you're rubbing up twine or the wires, um, or if there's been pruning going on, then cane blight can get in that way. Spur blight is only going to be coming through uh, the mature leaves for the most part. So they're, those larger leaves lower down on the cane. Um, so the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide, again, is a really good resource for uh, figuring out what products to use for raspberry cane diseases. But I've listed three organic options here. Your copper sulfate, your actinovate, and oxidate are all organic options for raspberry cane diseases. And some of the synthetic options include, again, Captivate, which is, I mentioned that before, um, that's captan plus fenhexamid. And so that is labeled for anthracnose and spur blight on raspberries. Um, your strobes, such as Abound, Cabrio, and Pristine are recommended for application at the onset of the disease. And with all of these, again, it's important to uh, reduce our resistance risk by limiting uh, these to two sequential applications of the same group or the same uh, family of chemistries and not overuse the product multiple times. All right, so I've got my contact information here. Uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, that was just a really quick um, few tips about some berry diseases. And 
So I can keep that up for a second. And if you have questions for any of us, go ahead and type those in the chat. Amaya, do you want to go over that question that was asked before about boron? Sure. I just realized that I didn't have my video on before. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> That's okay. So there's a question about whether, uh, for, uh, if I would recommend foliar borum, and, and the answer would be yes, if you have a deficiency, and I put there in the chat, uh, if you have a deficiency, you, you could apply um, some foliar borum, you could apply a solid bor that has about a 20% of borum, uh, a dose of two to six pounds of solid bor per acre, uh, you could apply it at early uh, bloom or in late summer for next year. And while other questions come in, Amaya, do you know why it's recommended not to apply uh, spring nitrogen on strawberries in terms of um, disease management? Because the more nitrogen you have in the spring, the more foliage you're going to have, and that foliage is going to be is going to be more tender. It's going to have more water, and the more water that tissue has, the more susceptible it's going to be for diseases. I mean, we know that. Bacteria and fungi, even though I'm not a pathologist, they propagate through water. They need free water. So the more lush that tissue is, the more susceptible it's going to be for any diseases. And the same is true. And, and, and Christelle maybe can talk about that. If you, if you um, over fertilize with nitrogen, this luxury consumption of nitrogen, it also makes it more attractive for insects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you think about um, a Japanese beetle or phylloxera that like the very tender leaves, then that's new growth, all this kind of new growth that you're going to have is going to make it more attractive to a lot of insects. Um, and another thing that I wanted to mention in terms of disease management, you know, when we think about disease management for berries, we're obviously not just thinking about the products that we're applying. Uh, there's a lot of cultural practices that you can think about um, such as making sure with raspberries that we are pruning correctly so that you're letting air flow through that canopy and not being tempted to leave too many canes out there. Um, I would say, you know, yeah, luxury consumption of N on raspberries would have that effect too of creating too large of a canopy. And so you've got a lot of humidity just hanging out in that canopy that can cause diseases. Um, the other thing is floor management. What is our ground cover? And uh, a lot of these diseases, especially anthracnose, they rely on uh, rain droplets splashing up from the ground onto the plants to transport those disease spores. And so if you have something like straw, there's not going to be as much splashing from the ground onto the plants versus with black plastic or landscape fabric. Of course, there's a lot of pros and cons to think about when you're choosing your ground cover, but that's just one thing to consider. Um, another thing is, are you, do you have a cover crop uh, or do you have a lot of weeds around uh, the patch? And that is something that can um, maintain disease spores as well. So definitely something to, to think about there. Tim Holland asked, would you apply before fruit set? But I'm not sure um, what you're referring to. So if you wanted to clarify that in the chat box. Uh, can I make a, a point here, just completely not unrelated, but um, I just saw something this morning from not a commercial grower, but still um, somebody that works with a lot of um, vines, it's in grapes, but that um, when and applied an, a fungicide that was not registered on grapes, that was a turf and ornamental version of Mencozeb. So I just want to, as people are thinking about their questions, give a big reminder to everybody that you might look at something, say what this grower, I talked to him this morning, did is he saw Mencozeb DF was the one for the disease he wanted to treat, went online and found something that was equivalent with the same active ingredient that was also the 25 DF. So he figured it has everything I need. And he applied that last year, luckily, not this summer but it was actually registered for turf and ornamentals. And so I just want everybody to please, especially if you find the labels online, just do a quick search for the crop. 
um, that you are spraying. If it's strawberry, blueberry, raspberry, just do a search for that and make sure it's on that label. Because I think it's something that can happen to the best of us when you're going too fast and you're looking for, um, there's generics and there's things like that that come on the market that suddenly you're like, oh, there's this spray mix or something like that. Like there's always so much information online that sometimes you find a better option that looks all identical. And we forget the basic step of making sure that the, the crop that we want to spray is on the label. Mm -hmm. And the consequences of something like that, luckily this grower is not, um, the commercial grower is not selling the grapes, but it could be devastating. It could lead to lawsuits and all of that. So because it happened today, I figured while people are talking, I'm thinking, I mean, I would just give a reminder on that. Um, and that would, um, I see something saying, sure, fungicide or insecticide. I don't know what that refers to. Um, he said, would you apply before fruit set? And I asked him to clarify. He's saying uh, insecticide and fungicide. Would you apply them before fruit set? Well, it depends what you're targeting for an, an insecticide. Mm -hmm. so, I'm talking. Sorry, my daughter barged in. <laughs> Um, it depends on what it is, um, but before fruit set, there are some things that you might want to uh, consider, like root worms or things like that, that you might want to be looking at uh, early in the season, or you could have thrips that showed up early on, and so you might be doing it before fruit set. Um, from a fungicide standpoint, I'll let you answer that, Annie, but it depends what you're targeting, obviously. Yeah, it depends on your t what you're targeting, and it depends on the product as well. Okay, so as far as what you're targeting, one example is, so powdery mildew, which that infects a lot of our different fruit crops. Um, it infects the leaves. Uh, anthracnose can also affect the leaves, specifically the petioles. And so if it's something that can infect the leaves, then you need to be thinking about that before fruit set. Um, also, as far as it depends on the product, um, I mentioned uh, organic products before. And a couple of the products I mentioned were Double Nickel and Regalia, which I was talking about them for strawberries, but they're not just for strawberries. They can be used on other berry crops as well. Um, those act to actually protect the plant and uh, in the case of Regalia, it helps the immune system of the plant basically. So it helps its natural defenses against diseases. And so if you're using that to control, let's say, Botrytis gray mold, um, you want to apply that before the infection is going to set in so that you can prepare the plant. You can, you can help the plant uh, defend itself before the infection sets in. Um, but there are other products that are meant to uh, control the disease as it is developing. And in that case, you would, uh, you would think about when is the disease actually um, impacting the plants. So it depends on, depends on the disease, depends on the products. Uh, and it also depends, you know, think about the weather and what the weather has been like. Has it been wet? Has it been really warm? Because those are the conditions that a lot of our diseases really like. Um, so it is 201. So we're gonna wrap up, but while people are still here, I just wanted to say along Crystal's point of um, staying with the label, I was also having a discussion with a grower recently um, about something that happened it was several years ago, but uh, they, accidentally applied a product that was labeled in Canada for strawberries. Um, he thought it was labeled in our state, but it was not. And uh, the Department of Agriculture can actually come out and, uh, and do checks on the farm to make sure that you're staying within label. And that actually happened to them. Um, and so there, there are fines associated with that. So make sure that if you're looking at a product, maybe a product that we mentioned here even, make sure that it's actually labeled in your state. Um, for instance, Dual Magnum, which is an herbicide that was just recently labeled in Minnesota, but it, it's labeled in a lot of states. And so somebody might think, well, I'm gonna apply that. It's actually not, until recently it wasn't um, labeled for berry crops. So it's really important to think about that. And also uh, the specific rate. So if you've got different formulations of the same chemical, the same active chemical, um, you need to still read the label and not assume that you know the rate because you were previously using a different formulation of that product. For instance, with Serenade, um, I'm, which is an organic product, I mentioned three different uh, types of Serenade, the Max, the Opti, and the other one, I can't remember what the other one is called, um, but they all have different recommended rates. So make sure you always read the label and look at the rate.
Um, Craig says, we found that they use plastic in their strawberries planting in the fall and harvesting in the next spring for eight to 10 weeks. How do they do that? Okay, so how do they plant and harvest strawberries when planting in plastic? I'm wondering if, well, if it were day neutral strawberries, they would typically be planted in the spring and not in the fall. So I am curious what system you might be referencing. Christelle or Amaya, do you know? I wonder if he's referring to, uh, to tunnels, low tunnels or high tunnels, instead of plastic, like a plastic mulch. I'm not sure if that's the question, but if that's the case uh, in warmer areas, and I don't know where, where you saw that, uh, if, uh, you use a uh, low tunnel, so you can you can definitely have protection the following year and under winters that are not as severe as ours with the protection of that plastic with low tunnel. Do you think that's day neutrals that he's talking about if they're harvesting for eight to ten weeks? Probably. Okay. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up since it's two oh four and everybody's got to get back out to the field. Um, so thank you for joining us. And if you have further questions, feel free to get in touch with any of us. Um, so the Wisconsin Fruit website is really awesome. They have a newsletter and uh, a lot of really great articles accumulated there. So that's fruit.wisc.edu. We have a blog at U of M Extension as well. That's called the U of M Extension Fruit and Vegetable News. Our articles go out every Thursday during the growing season. So we'll be putting out an issue tomorrow. And then we have a Facebook page as well called UMN Extension Fruit and Vegetable Farming. And going back to the first question about where the handouts are, they will be posted on both of those websites. So if you go to the, Wisconsin, the fruit edu or the other one, the U University of Minnesota, on there, there will be a post saying the webinar is now posted and you can access everything there, the whole webinar with the handouts that are like part of the presentation. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Annie, for hosting this and uh, moderating. And thank, thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a good summer.